All right, we are going to be looking in the chapters that we're in this week, and I want to draw your attention to several things that are happening. We interrupted Jesus where we finished on Sunday night in the middle of his discourse. So uh, chapter 13 of John, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16 all happen uh, in the same, we just call it, let's say, the same moment. So uh, we stopped Jesus right in the middle, uh, or two-thirds of the way through, I guess, or three-fourths of the way through. Chapter 16 continues um, his thought, then chapter 17 is a prayer, and then Judas comes with the mob and he gets arrested. So we're in the last moments of Jesus' life, and I wanted to uh, draw your attention to a phrase that gets repeated. So we're, we're going to um, jump around a little bit, but we're going to be in chapter 16 predominantly. But I wanted to sort of look at it, look at what we're going to consider in a little bit bigger picture. So chapter 16, verse 1, the very first phrase, he says, these things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. So when I was reading through the chapters, preparing uh, to study them, one of the things that I've been doing is just reading them over and over and over again. So uh, I started to notice that phrase, these things I've spoken to you, because it's at the end of chapter 16 also. Do you notice verse 33? These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. That's a pretty famous verse. Probably lots of you have that verse memorized. But the phrase that's the same is these things I've spoken to you. Verse 1, these things I've spoken to you. So this section that we're in, we have Jesus speaking directly to his disciples and thankfully... He tells, that, tells us what his purpose was in speaking. So one of the purposes of this section is that you won't stumble. That's what verse 1 says. I've spoken these things to you so that you won't stumble. So you can take the things that we've learned starting in chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16. Take those things and including his prayer, chapter 17. And you could say Jesus' agenda or his goal One of the things he's trying to accomplish in that teaching is that we won't stumble. Now, you guys that did your reading, you know that verse 1 of chapter 16 is following in the immediate context. Then of chapter 15 is a warning about persecution. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they listen to me, they're going to listen to you. You're going to be hated by everybody for my sake. So he's telling them ahead of time so that they'll know later um, that... uh, that it's not outside of God's plan, so that they won't stumble. Uh, Verse 33, that statement, um, we're not going to obviously cover it. It Maybe Sunday morning, I don't know, but it's a great verse. I've spoken these things uh, to you so that in me you'll have peace. So if you're lacking peace, you can go to the teaching of Jesus in this section, and you'll find the things that he says are intended by him to create peace in you. So... What happens in chapter 13? He washes their feet. He says, I've given you an example. So washing people's feet and humbling yourself and putting other people as more important than you, that will bring peace into your life. Let me tell you, won't bring peace into your life. Making yourself number one. (laughs) That will bring discord and frustration into your life. But putting other people, just saying, oh, you go in front of me. All of a sudden you're like, man, I feel a lot better than, why are these people cutting me off? Why can't I be first? Why can't this go the way I want it to go? Why do these people have to have this agenda? That takes away all of your peace. So if you could just walk back through the things that we've learned and take these two, just these two statements. But I counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. He says, these things I've spoken to you in chapter 14, in chapter 15, in chapter 16. So I wanted to start with that and kind of sort of lay like a much a larger picture, like a larger, if we're going to think of it, you guys that are older, you know, you could lay, lay something over. You remember those old books you could lay over the, over the skeleton, the muscles or the veins, and you could lay over this other thing. Um, you have an app where you could, the Instagram layover setting, filter. You could lay over dog ears on your head. You're not, these kids are like, you know, you're not even, grandpa, give it up. So let's look at a few of these. John 14, this is the first one. John 14, verse 25. And and this this one's the most important one. I'm starting with it first because uh, I want to come back to this idea because we're looking at Jesus in this moment 
speaking in person, face to face with his disciples with a certain purpose that his words, when he speaks to them, is going to accomplish this in their life, physically present with them. he, He says what he's intending. But in this verse, he talks about a future ministry that will take place with them. He had said it's to their benefit that he would leave. He said, these things I've spoken to you, verse 25, or chapter 14, verse 25. These things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I said to you. And my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you. So don't let your heart be troubled and neither let it be afraid. So I'm speaking these things to you right now, being present with you. And we've already jumped ahead and did the two in chapter 16, uh, the bookends. There's some in the middle. Uh, But he makes this point that When he ascends into heaven, after he dies on the cross and rises from the dead, when he ascends into heaven, he's going to give the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit now will, for each one of us, take this this moment that we're looking at in chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, Jesus with his disciples ministering to them, speaking to them for certain purposes so they won't stumble, so they'll have peace, so they'll have joy, the things that he's going to say. But he says, but the Spirit, when he comes... He's going to guide you into all truth. He's introducing the idea to them in this context. While he's doing this, he's telling them that as he ascends into heaven, someone else is going to do this. That's extremely important for us. Uh, Chapter 15, verse 3. He said, you're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. So there's another phrase, I've spoken to you. Uh, In that section that we looked at on Sunday morning about abiding, that cleansing power of the word of Jesus. They only needed to, uh, to have their feet washed because they were clean. He reminds them here again. He says, you're clean because of the word that I spoke to you. So the word that he spoke to them uh, cleansed them. And in the context, it's, it's the, the pruning of the branches that bear fruit, uh, that they'll be able to bring forth more fruit. So the, the word of Jesus is going to take away those things out of your life that hinder fruitfulness and create space for more fruit in your life. Uh, Chapter 15, verse 11. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. The words of Jesus intended by him to bring them joy. Sorrow has filled their heart. And we'll see one of the other statements in a minute. Sorrow has filled their heart because of what he said. But chapter 15, verse 11. I've spoken these things to you that my joy may remain in you. Uh, Chapter 16, verse 1. we, We already read it. These things I've spoken to you that you would not be made to stumble. Look at verse 4. These things I've told you. It's, that's the same in, in the original language. These, these things I've spoken to you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I didn't say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going away. So this teaching is a specific teaching preparatory for his departure to prepare them for the emotional reality of it. They're hurting. They're not going to understand. He's going to say, I'm going and you don't understand. I'm going to go away. I'm going to come back. They don't get it. They ask questions about it. But he's speaking these things to them to get them through this difficult time that they're in. That's really important. Now, we can't necessarily directly apply that to our lives because Jesus has already died. He's risen from the dead. He's not going to speak to us to get us through that horrible moment from the time that he's dead till the time that he rises. Those three days, what, what a horrible time for the disciples. The one that walked on water, who calmed the storm, who raised the dead, who could cleanse a leper, who rescued them, who loved them and was patient with them and gracious with them, has died and he's in the grave. They know that he's dead. They didn't understand his teaching. They weren't really paying attention to him. They hadn't been listening about the resurrection. And so those three days, boy, uh, what a hard and horrible time. But then he rises from the dead and he has victory and everything's different. So what, what they needed to get through those three days, like we're not going through that. that. That's different. It's unique to them. But the principle is exactly the same. The principle that you might be going through something and to get from point A to point B is going to require something. And Jesus, by speaking to us, by giving us his word, and in the context, Jesus personally with them trying to speak to them and give them what they need 
because he's personally with them by speaking to them to get them through the difficulty that they're in. He's telling them that in the future, when the Spirit comes, this thing that's happening right now, in this unique moment, the Spirit will do that in every other unique moment, every other difficulty, every other dark three-day period, every other two-year period, every other 40-year period, every other season that you'd ever face in your life, the Spirit now is going to occupy the same role that Jesus uh, has towards them. I've told you these things so that you can remember them when I told you about this, so that when they're going through something in the future, like, well, he was with us. He already told us. He spoke to us about what was going to happen. He already did it in this season. Surely he can take care of me in the next season. In verse 6, uh, because I said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Now, that has, that has to take us back to uh, chapter 13, verse 36. Uh, He's, he tells Simon Peter, when Peter says, where are you going? And Jesus says, where I'm going, you can't follow me now, but you'll follow me afterwards. Uh, verse 33 is what Peter was referring to. Little children, I will be with you a little while longer. You'll seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you can't come. And so I say to you now. Peter says, what are you talking about? We don't, we don't understand this. And, and, and so that, that's the thing that he had said that caused them this trouble. Their hearts were troubled. They, they weren't grasping the idea, they were really caught up with the thought that Jesus was going to make everything physically better. He was going to get rid of the Romans. He was going to establish a kingdom. They were part of it. They'd been with him. They were going to have a role in his kingdom, and he was going to, he was going to have a great victory. So when he's telling them he's going to go away, and they can't come, and they're going to be troubled, and they're not going to have peace, and, but he's going to give them peace, it, it was causing them difficulty. I wanted to make sure that we noted this, verse 6, because when Jesus said, I've spoken these things to you and sorrow has filled your heart, that also will happen to you. Not for the same reason in the same unique way that it was happening to them, but I can honestly say if I'm going to be uh, utterly truthful and, and humble and open, I'd have to say many times the Lord's spoken to me about what he wanted to do, and I was sad when I heard it. And I thought, that is not the plan that we had for my life. <laughs> I mean, I had for my life. I mean, apparently you didn't have it because you're telling me something else. There are certain situations where things start to go awry and the Lord starts, like, this is the way it is. You just need to deal with it. I want you to be patient. I want you to be humble. I want you to humble yourself way more than, I, than you were expecting to humble yourself. I've had that happen to me so many times where I, I was in a situation, the Lord had kind of prepared me, I knew, and then once it started to unfold, it was like, this is not what I was anticipating. It's requiring way more sacrifice than what I had prepared myself for. And, but the Lord's saying, this is what I'm saying. So including times like that. So I, we're, just, we're just examining how Jesus in this moment is ministering to these guys in speaking to them and looking at each one of the times where he says, I've spoken to you, and then thinking, well, does this happen in general, in principle with us, with the Spirit? And I would say, so far, yes. Uh, chapter 16, also verse 25. He says, these things I've spoken to you in figurative language. So he adds that little phrase there, figurative language. But the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. So there might be a, a season and a moment where, where I'm at spiritually, I'm not really totally understanding what the Lord's saying to me. And, and as I grow and I go through the circumstance, then I'm going to grow into a place where the more uh, plain teaching... I mean, let's put it like this. Have you ever been with somebody who has a massive problem with impatience, but they don't think that they do? And you say, well, why don't we just, why don't you just, like, just simmer down a little bit? Let's just, we can be patient. We'll just wait. Let, we'll just wait. And you try to make it positive, and, they, the, and there's nothing you can do. But they're not, they wouldn't, they're, they're like, I just don't know why these people are acting like this. It's like, well, I'm not sure you're act, why you're acting like you're acting. You're the Christian. Or have you ever been around somebody who has a massive problem of pride, but they actually think they're humble? You see, there could be some season in my life where I, I'm in a spot and the Lord's trying to speak to me, and I'm not really open. I'm not getting it. And, and so Jesus is saying, I'm speaking to you in the best way that you can understand it. And can we, we have to be honest about these guys in this moment. Do they have any idea what's about to happen? No. Has he been trying to tell them very plainly? Yes. 
Are they getting it? No. And why? They're, they're fighting amongst themselves about what the kingdom is and their place in it as it relates to making them bigger, bigger men or, or having more. You know, they, they, they haven't let go of something. And so the language that's happening is not really happening. They're not understanding. And, and I would say this also happens. I can imagine in my life so many times, and I don't have to look back very far. And I'm not thinking like many, many years ago when I used to be weak, and now that I'm no longer weak, this doesn't apply. No, I think this has applied today, where the Lord would say, you know, I'm trying to speak to you, <laughs> and uh, you know, time will come, maybe you'll humble yourself a bit, and then I can use plain language, but right now, it's, you know, I'm having to use like a picture. Okay, what does this look like, Rich? Like, it looks like you need to get on board with my plan. These things I've spoken to you. He says this several times, and then the last one, verse 33, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. He says, I've spoken these things to you so that you'll be able to find peace in this chaotic world where you will have tribulation. Verse 33, in the world you'll have tribulation. He is not promising peace, meaning that he's going to remove you from tribulation, and by removing you from tribulation, you're going to have peace. What he promises them is you're going to be in the middle of tribulation and you will never get out of it. And I am going to be with you in the tribulation such that by me speaking to you, like right now, these things that he said in this context, I've spoken these things to you so that in me you'll have peace. My word can bring you a peace without removing you from the difficulty. You can, you can manage the difficulty and stay in the middle of it, but because of my word to you, and, and obviously, if you just think 24 hours from when he says this, this is the worst day of their lives. Peter's going to chop a guy's ear off. He's going to abandon the Lord. He's going to deny Jesus three times. All the disciples are going to leave Jesus to face this trial all by himself. There's one disciple who seems to have been known to the high priest who goes into the courtyard, brings Peter into the courtyard, which doesn't turn out so well for Peter, but there's some, one of the disciples, unnamed, many people think it's John, he never names himself. Uh, he, he seems to be also at the cross, and he, Jesus uh, says to him, you know, take care of my mom, and, and, and kind of commits the two of them together. So uh, all of these guys are going to find out things about themselves that they never, never would want to know about themselves. They're cowards, they're failures, they're losers, <laughs> They're the, they're the biggest rejects. Why would you pick us to be your disciples when in the worst moment we abandon ship and leave you to sink on your own? And, and Jesus says, all these things I've spoken to you so that you'll have joy, so that after this happens, you'll remember what I said to you, so that you'll have my peace. In the world, you're gonna have tribulation. You're never gonna escape tribulation. If you're listening to me and you're a Christian and you think that being a Christian is a way to escape tribulation, you don't understand the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that that's not a smart thing to wish for, and I'm not saying that that's not a wise thing to hope for, and I'm not, I'm not saying that that's not what all of us have as our agenda, but that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Jesus promised us or warned us about or told us about. That's why he said, I'm telling you these things so that you won't stumble. Because some people think that, well, I wasn't walking with the Lord, and I had hard things. Now I am walking with the Lord, so that means all the hard things are going to go away. No, it doesn't. It actually means probably it's going to get worse. Because before you were on Team Darkness, led by the devil himself, quarterback, all pro, you know, uh, 6,000 years running. He's never lost a match except for one. Uh, Jesus defeated him. Uh, You know, just he didn't even score a point against Jesus. It was infinity to less than nothing. Uh, But everybody else he won, undefeated. Wiped every, like, like, so we were in the, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. We were in the kingdom of darkness, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, he sent Jesus, Jesus died, and when we put our faith in Jesus, he takes us out of the devil's grasp, rips us out, and brings us into the kingdom of light and life, and now it's on because now there's spiritual warfare, and now every step that you try to take forward, the devil wants to meet you, and say, oh, you're going to be a good husband? I'm going, to, I'm going to make you the worst husband ever. Oh, you want to be a wife and you want to be submissive? I'm going, to, I'm going to make you the most unsubmissive, angry wife ever. 
You're going to be the fulfillment of that verse on a, on a rainy day, a continual dripping. That's going to be your motto as a wife. He, he, he's going he's, he's to work to try to make you the worst employee or the worst employer. If you get promoted to be a manager, he's going to try to undermine you every step of the way at your job. He's going to try to bring a pandemic to make you totally depressed. He's going to shut down. I mean, he's going to do everything. The devil hates God. He hates the kingdom of God. He loves the Republican Party and the Democrat Party because they're self, they have a self-agenda. But, but he hates the church of Jesus Christ, the believers, the followers of Jesus, as they commune together and seek God and seek to serve the Lord together. He hates that because his gates can't prevail against the church. And he's a defeated foe. And so he'll fight that. So when someone comes to faith, they're, they're going to be experiencing so many difficulties. And so it's really important. We're, we're looking in this section that we're reading. It's such an important passage of Scripture because John gives us a window into the last minutes of Jesus' life, his last discourse, his last time encouraging his disciples. And he repeats several times, I've spoken these things to you. And in each, one of the, each time he says it, he gives you some effect of that, some reason for that. And in the same section is where he tells them, it's better for you that I'm going away. Because if I go away, the Holy Spirit will come. And so the very thing that we observe in these chapters of Jesus ministering in this way with these men in this moment, that his words would do these things for them, you can just take that and say, well, is it reasonable to think that now that the Spirit is being poured out, that every single one of us, individually, whatever we're going through, whatever our version is of the current difficulty and trial that we're having, that everyone's having, that, that Jesus' word, now in the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that he's going to be doing the same thing for each one of us. I would say the answer is an, an, a resounding yes. All caps, a bunch of exclamation points, some fire emoji, and uh, maybe a gif, a curly gif, you know, doing a little whoop, 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 kind of a, that's just for Tom. Tom, Tom knows where I'm headed with that. So the, the idea is, well, Jesus starts to talk about it earlier, um, verse 16 of chapter 14, jump back. I'm going to kind of pull some of these together, and then we're going to look at a, a, a little section in chapter 16. So look at chapter 14, verse 16 and 17. He said, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. I'm gonna give you another helper. We, we talked about this a little bit on Sunday night. The idea of a helper, this is, this is the person that you call out to who comes alongside and their presence makes all the difference. This is your friend that knows how to fix a car. And when you decided that you were gonna change the head gasket yourself because you didn't think it was that hard and then you were trying to tighten one of the head bolts on there and for whatever reason, maybe your torque wrench was kind of off kilter and you just heard this snap. And you went, oh no. And you busted a head bolt in, in the block. And who are you going to call? Art Loesch. Right? You're going to call Art. Because you know, if Art was part of the project, it's immediately better. It's immediately going to happen. He's going to be able to do it. There's nothing that he can't do. Right? You guys that have, have you know, and if you don't have his phone number, we'll give it out to you. Uh, sorry, Art. Just joking. His number is Ask Jesus for Help. So, I mean, you, have a, you all have friends like that. You have an electrician friend. You have a carpenter friend. You have uh, some person in some way you think like, well, I need help. The word translated as helper, this doesn't mean like, oh, this is mommy's little helper. This is some person. They're, they're not really qualified. They're like an apprentice. They haven't really learned. They're a journeyman. They're kind of getting up to speed. They're not a master yet. This doesn't mean helper, helper, like way, the way we might use that word. This is, the word literally means to call alongside. And the picture is this. You're in trouble. You can't do it. And you go, please help. And this person comes. And whatever the issue is, you ask for help. They come alongside and they help. Whatever it is. This person can do everything like Jesus 
was there with them. He said, I'm leaving, but it's to your advantage that I go away. Jesus, when he was here on the earth, is limited in the sense that he's physically human. Yes, he's still God. He still knows everything. He still, in some way, I think, was somehow participating. I don't know. He's not omniscient because he's human, but there's some way that he's still the, word, the infinite word of God, that, that wonderful, amazing nature of Jesus, uh, deity and humanity at once. But he says about the spirit that he will be inside of us now. Verse 17. Not only he's been with you, but he will be in you. Up until this point, he had not come to live inside of them. The Spirit of God in the new covenant comes to live inside of us, and now we all of us have what Jesus is seeking to do for them in these chapters. These things I've spoken to you. Now this person, the Spirit of truth, is living inside of us, and these very things we see Jesus doing, he's now doing for me. He's saying, Rich, I'm speaking these things to you so you won't stumble. Rich, I'm speaking these things to you so that my... My joy would remain in you. Your joy would be full. I'm speaking these things to you so that you'll have peace. In the world, you're having tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. He's inside of me now. And when I'm starting to lose my peace, he starts to speak to me so that I won't lose my peace. When I'm losing my joy, he starts to speak to me so I won't lose my joy. Tenderly, intimately, like Jesus is with his disciples in these chapters, personally, He's there on this, they're walking from the old city out across the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives. He's present with them, looking them in the eyes, they're talking. They're not wearing masks, they're not six feet apart. There's no pandemic. They're hugging each other, they're close. They've been together for three years, they've been in battle for three years. They've been casting out demons, they've, been, they've had so many trials. They're bonded, they are so knit together, and they love each other, and they love him, and he is troubled. And it's a very strange time, and he is pouring out his heart to them that it's better that he goes away so that this person, the spirit of truth, will come. And now what they experience, I can experience every single day, me personally, while simultaneously you're experiencing the same thing personally where you live and in your life. Every single one of us has a personal relationship with God. He's not limited in any way to be with every single one of us. He's not like, oh, hold on. You know, this person's in trouble. You wait. You're, you're doing okay. And I'm going to come over here. It's not like when I took my kids fishing when they were little. Uh, I always tried to, we have five kids, uh, which makes uh, some things as a parent difficult to do. One of them in particular was to take them fishing. So I learned after several tries that I could take two fishing poles for the five kids. I could only keep two poles in the water. That was the only reasonable thing. It was the only way to keep one of the, you know, at least one pole from hooking someone's head or you know, taking someone's ear off or something. Two, I, could get, I could keep two poles in the water. That was all I could do. That was my total capacity. It's not like God's like me trying to say, well, well there's just so many, oh, the pandemic. <sighs> What am I going to do now? Everyone's praying at the same time. Then everyone's all troubled. He has no problem. Right here in this passage, Jesus is with them. And what we see him doing, he's introducing the idea that the Spirit is going to do this for us. So let's, let's jump back to chapter 16. And I want to look at some of the things that he says. The Spirit coming now, this ministry uh, is not only going to be for us, it's going to be to the world. Uh, he points out in chapter 16, if you look at verse, uh, well, verse 5, he says, Now I'm going, to, I'm going to him, away to him who sent me, and none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrows filled your heart. And nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. If I don't go away, the helper, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I'll send him to you. So, the thing that you're sad about, that I, I've said something that made you sad, it's only because you don't understand what's happening. That's going to happen to us. Someone here tonight probably is sad about something, and honestly, Jesus would be saying to you, like he said to them, the only reason you're sad is you don't understand what's really happening. Actually, I'm going to take these things that are bad, and this is bad, and that's bad. I'm actually going to turn all this stuff around for good. You just can't see it yet. You just don't know. Now, not everything do we find out, you know, at some point in our life. Some things are hard and we don't understand and they hurt, um, you know, I think probably maybe till we go see the Lord. But I think for most things, uh, it, we'll realize it. And he tells them here in verse 7, it's to your advantage that I go away. I wonder how many of them believe that when he said it. 
oh yeah, right, to our advantage that you're going to leave us. It's never been to our advantage when you left. You know, like, we're the children of Israel. Like when Moses went up on the mountain, that was to their advantage, right? No, that wasn't. Remember, they made a golden calf. How could this be to our advantage? But the helper will come. His ministry to the world, verse 8 and 9, and, and well, 8 through 11, he says, when he's come, he'll convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, of sin because they don't believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, and of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So it's to your advantage because the Spirit is going to move differently. When Jesus ascends into heaven and the Spirit is poured out, the Spirit of God is going to move in a way that he hasn't been moving in the world before because now the gospel can be preached. And so he's going to convict the world of sin, and specifically Jesus said, because they don't believe in me. When you preach the gospel to somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus, you know, because Jesus told you, that the Spirit of God is going to be doing an unseen work in their heart, convicting them that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And you might not even be doing a good job of being persuasive, but the Spirit of God is doing a good job of being persuasive. He will convict them of sin and of righteousness because he's going to the Father, the righteousness of Christ, and of a judgment, the judgment that's coming because the ruler of this world is judged. When we preach the gospel, the, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus so that people who believe in him can be saved, the Spirit of God will be speaking to people, convicting them. So it's to our advantage for that reason, but also for this reason, verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So this moment... And we, we love these chapters. We love chapter 13 to chapter 17. The prayer of chapter 17 is a holy moment in the life of Jesus. We get to overhear him speaking to the Father, even about us. He prays for us in chapter 17 also. So this, this incredible section, and in the middle of the section, Jesus says, I have so many things that I want to say. And that what I've said is not sufficient. It's not enough. It's not everything that you need. And he said, but don't worry. When he comes, he'll be able to tell you everything you need. He's the spirit of truth. And when he comes to you, he will give you everything you need for every situation that you're in. He'll glorify me. Or I'm sorry, verse 13. He, the spirit of truth, when he's come, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to come. I don't believe that that's primarily talking about prophetic events. You know, he's going to explain who the Antichrist is or something like that. It can include that. But I think he will tell you what's happening. He will, and I think in this moment that we're living in, I don't need to know who's going to win the election. I need to know what Jesus wants me to do, though. I don't need to know which of these propositions are going to be voted, you know, yes or no for. I have a strong opinion about a bunch of them. I have a strong opinion maybe about the presidential election. I have a strong opinion about abortion. I have a strong opinion about uh, the marriage and what it means and what the state's interest is in marriage, something that's a biblical institution. I don't understand why the state has an interest in it at all and wants to define terms that are defined in the Bible. I thought we had a constitution that lets me have my own freedom of thought, but apparently not anymore. I don't know. Like we're, I have a strong opinion about it. But you know what I want more than anything else? I want the spirit of truth to show me what's happening. Because I'm positive I don't know what's happening. I'm positive that there isn't anybody in the media that knows what's happening. And there's only one person, the spirit of truth, that I trust. But he now lives in me. Jesus is saying, I have so many things that I'd love to tell you guys right now. You can't handle it. But in the future, when this moment is over and he's died and he's risen from the dead and he ascends into heaven and the Spirit comes out, later in the book of Acts, they're going to have a, they're going to have a big struggle with what do we do with Gentile believers? Do they need to become Jews before they can get saved? Do we need to circumcise them? And there's going to be a bunch of Jewish former Pharisees who have become obedient to the faith. They're part of the church and they're going to have a strong opinion that everybody needs to become a Jew and become circumcised in order to get saved. And they're going to have a big, big difficulty with that. And guess what? They're going to get right through it. Acts chapter 15. They're going to have a gathering that has a big controversy and the 
the net result is going to be the saying please the whole multitude. They're going to have a problem in the church of racial division between the Hellenists, the, the Greek speaking. Well, it's not, ra- I guess it's, it's as racial as anything because I think there's only the human race. It's a cultural thing. It's cultural. There's a cultural thing. And these guys follow the Greek culture. These Jewish widows follow the Hebrew culture, and they feel like they're not being treated the same. And it, it's, it, it, it could tear the church in half. But what happens is the Spirit. The Spirit gives gifts. The Spirit brings unity to them. They, the, the Spirit of truth guides them. Everything they face in the book of Acts, Jesus isn't there anymore. Paul's shipwrecked. An angel appears to him. I mean, there's, there's things that happen, but they navigate all kinds of crazy hard, super difficult, wonderful opportunities, terrible trials that they navigate and they do it as the Spirit of God helps them and leads them. The Spirit of truth, when he's come, he'll guide you into all truth. Verse 14 of chapter 16. He will glorify me. He will take what is mine and he'll declare it to you. And all the things that the Father has are mine and therefore I said, he will take of mine and he will declare it to you. What's the phrase we were looking at? I said eight times. Jesus said, I've spoken these things to you. What is he telling you that the spirit of truth is going to do? He's going to, de- he's going to declare to you. He's going to speak to you. I'm speaking these things to you, so this and this and this. But it's better for you that I'm gone because when I'm gone, the spirit of truth will come. And what's he going to do? He's going to speak to you in any situation, in any, any circumstance that you're in. Now, uh, See where I wanted to. I want to. I want to get to this next thing. So, all right. I'm. I'm doing. I'm doing something that you shouldn't do. I'm jumping all over the place. There's. There's a big. There's a big tie. There's this big thread that goes through this whole thing, and it's not following sequentially in the verses. So Jesus has been doing this. He now says the Spirit when He comes, He's going to do this. And now I want you to see what He says about prayer. So. Keeping those two thoughts in your mind, jump to chapter 16, verse uh, 25. These things I've spoken to you in figurative language. The time is coming when I'll no longer speak to you in figurative language. I will tell you plainly about the Father. And in that day, you'll ask in my name, and I don't say that I'll pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you because you've loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I'm sorry, I skipped. that's the wrong verse. That's not the one I'm looking for. Oh, it's right before that. Uh, verse 22. He, he repeats himself. So the previous thought, verse 22, therefore you have sorrow. He keeps saying, he's reminding them that I'm, 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 a, I'm aware of how you feel. You have sorrow. I will see you again. Your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. And in that day, you'll ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you'll receive that your joy may be full. Then the figurative language verse, verse 25, then the other verse. In that day, you'll ask in my name. I, I don't say I'll pray the Father for you. The Father loves you. So he's, he, in the context, is going to be talking about prayer. But I want you to notice something very interesting. Verse 23, the first phrase. And we're leaving it in that context. He says, and in that day you'll ask me nothing. There's something we can't see in English, but in the original language, the word that he uses for ask, right there, the first phrase, is different than the second ask in verse 23. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. The second ask is the word that is used through the rest of the passage when it talks about us asking the Father. It could be translated as demand. It's a very interesting concept. It, uh, it, this, this word ask, the second one, has, has to do with uh, Jesus uh, giving us the invitation to come to the Father and beseech him and and. When we when the when prayers when we're encouraged to prayer to pray the words are always imperative verbs. I don't know if you ever thought about that when you pray. It, you don't really want someone to use an imperative verb to you. Like it, a par- an imperative is a command. It's it's the expression of us. We're coming to someone superior to us. We come with so much faith that and, and with humility, and yet at the same time that faith and humility is expressed in 
this stronger word that means to make a demand. So that's the word that's used, that Jesus uses to talk about us talking to the Father. It's never used of Jesus praying to the Father. The word that's used of Jesus praying to the Father is the first one he uses. Verse 23, when he says, in that day you will ask me nothing, that ask is a word that doesn't have the stronger connotation of a demand. It just means to ask a question. Uh, or It's not even so much to make a simple request. It means, it means to uh, approach a person with some question or inquiry or query. So that's the word that's used of Jesus with the Father. They're equals, and they're just in communion. And when Jesus, Jesus uses that of him, and he, when he uh, says in uh, chapter 14... Uh, where he says that I will pray the Father and he will give you another uh, helper. I said verse, verse 16, chapter 14, verse 16, where Jesus says, I will pray the Father. That's the, that's the same Greek word as uh, verse 23, the first one. So when Jesus asks, it's a certain word. When we ask, it's a different Greek word. Sometimes... The word that's used of Jesus is used of us, but when Jesus talks to the disciples about them asking in this context, he always uses this word, and this word is never used of him. Now you might say, well, what's the big deal about this? I'm barely following what you're saying. You're talking about two different Greek words, and in English it all looks the same. There's a super important point. He's not talking about prayer in the first statement of verse 23. That's what I want to get to. In that day you will ask me nothing. Because in this context, we're talking about chapter 13, 14, 15, 16. When Jesus says, there's a day coming, in what day? Well, then the spirit of truth is going to come in that day. When he's ascended, the spirit of truth comes. He's going to guide you into all truth. And that day you're not going to ask me any question. He's not saying, he's not talking specifically with that first phrase saying, when you pray, don't talk to me. You only talk to the Father. Don't say, Jesus, help me. He's not forbidding us from, he's not talking specifically about how we pray. He's talking to them about asking questions. This is very important related to the point that I'm trying to build here by looking at these larger themes in the section. Do they ask questions in this section? Do you guys read the chapters? This is probably the only time in his ministry that anybody asked him a series of good questions. <laughs> Most of the time they're asking him questions. They're bad questions. I mean, they're dishonest questions. They're trapping, entrapment questions. But let, let's, let's just go back and look at, at these because they're, they're, they, they kind of lead the discussion. Uh, Jesus says, "Where I'm, chapter 13, go back. The first question that we have Jesus had said, a little while, like I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you can't come. I'm now saying that to you. So first question is John 13, verse 36. Peter said, Lord, where are you going? P- Jesus said, this is what, I th- this is what I'm going to do. And Peter says, I don't understand what you're saying. Where are you going? We don't, I don't know what you mean. I don't, I don't understand that. Do you know anybody else who would, who would look at their life right now and say, I don't know what this means? I don't know where we're going. I don't know where you're going with this, Lord. I don't know what's happening here. Do you know anybody else might be going through something like that? That's kind of a question. Then Jesus answers that. First, you know, Peter says, well, verse 37 is another question. Let's give Peter the benefit of the doubt. Jesus said, where I'm going, you can't come. You don't understand what I'm saying. Verse 37, Peter says, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. I don't understand why you're forbidding me from this. I'm ready for this. You know anybody else who has a high view of themselves that probably is a little bit off? (laughs) Then he says, don't be troubled. You believe in God. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. I'm going to come back. Look at verse 5. Here's the next question. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? That's a legitimate question. Lord, I don't understand the destination. I don't know this path. We're here with you. We're ready to die with you. We came here. Thomas said earlier, let's go with them. Let's die with them. These guys are all in as best they can, but they don't have any idea. Lord, we don't understand what you're doing. We don't know the way. We don't know the way to go. Verse 8, another question. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and that's enough. 
We just need to know God. That's our big issue. If you could just show us God, if there's a way you could show us God. Look down at verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot, said, Lord, how is it that you're going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? How in the world is this going to work, Lord? <laughs> what in the world are you talking about? You're gonna, we're going to know what's going on. They're not going to know what's going on. How is this going to happen? If you're going to make yourself king, I don't understand the nature of your kingdom. I don't know why these things are happening to us. I don't know what you're saying. With that in mind, the reality of the moment that we're looking at, now let's look again at those verses. Verse 22, chapter 16, verse 22. Therefore, you now have sorrow. I'll see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. And in that day, you'll ask me nothing. I don't think he's giving them a treatise on prayer and what you can and cannot say in prayer. I think in the context, what he's saying is, and he's repeated it. We didn't go through all, he's talked about the Spirit repeatedly in this chapter 16. He's, it's the emphasis in chapter 16. And what he's saying is, when you're now in the new covenant and the Spirit of God's inside of you, these very questions that you have, you get an answer, and you get it from the Spirit. And he'll speak to you like I've been trying to speak to you. He's going to be in you, and he's going to be communing with you. And these very questions that you guys are asking in that day, you won't need to ask me those questions because the Spirit of God will be saying, this is the way, walk in it. You'll hear him speak to you. You see, it's really important that we understand that Christianity is about a human being coming into a living and vital relationship with God where they surrender their life to him and the, the two become one. That we, we enter into a relationship with God and the Spirit comes to live inside of us and our questions are asked, by, are asked out of our heart. They're asked by our honest, the same, the same honesty these guys have in this moment. Lord, we don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. And Jesus is saying, in that day, you the relationship is going to be totally different. Because in that day, the Spirit now... Now, what did we learn about on Sunday? Let's tie it all up and we'll close. What did we learn about on Sunday? What did Jesus say? I'm the vine. And the vine includes the fruit. It includes the branches. includes all the leaves. includes the, everything. The vine is everything. But you guys get to be part of... You're the branches. You're part of the vine. And if you stay connected, you're going to bear fruit. He presents a picture of a of somebody having a personal relationship with God that, that if that connection can remain unbroken, what does that mean? It means it's possible to have a connection that remains unbroken. Now, what will that mean in my marriage? What will that mean for me at my job? What will that mean for me living in a world that, that's going to be full of tribulation or a world full of darkness, full of sinners, full of people who are confused, who don't know the truth? Well, I'm connected to Jesus. The Spirit of God's going to prompt me. He's going to say, go out of your way for this person. I'm not going to go out of my way for that person. I don't want to do that. Lord, I, I had the whole morning set up. I'm going to do this, this, and this. I want you to help this person. And then I get to make a decision. Do I have the ability to do that? Do I have, the, you know, do I have authority to do that? Am I on someone else's time? Or The Spirit of God will start communing with me. But Lord, I don't know the way. And he'll just say, well, that's the way. The Spirit is now inside of me. Please, do not let Christianity become anything other than that for you. <laughs> that, that's, that's the bullseye. That's the target. Any, like Christianity isn't anything other than you having a personal relationship with God and the spirit of truth living inside of you. And that day you won't ask me any questions. Now, in the context, he starts to talk about prayer and, and that you can now directly speak to the Father. You can ask the Father anything in my name and he'll do it. So I wanted to, it's a big, big walk around the park, but I, I wanted you to see in this section that we're in, there's, some very, there's something very dynamic that's happening that we absolutely, in 2020, in October, with a couple weeks left of the election or whatever, with everything that's going on, what Jesus said to them and what he pointed to as a reality that, in fact, is reality right now, oh my goodness, why is it that not every single Christian is walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? What in the world were we doing? What, what is going on? Why isn't the church packed? 
Why isn't everybody seeking the Lord? Why isn't everybody reading their Bible every day? What in the world's going on? Why are, why are people, why are wives being mean to their husbands, husbands being mean to their wives, p- kids being dismissed as being, you're just driving me crazy? There's no fruit. Why isn't there fruit? There's no fruit because there's no abiding. How could there possibly be no abiding when that's, that's the thing that Jesus is talking about? Now, I'm not saying this to make anybody in this room feel guilty. You guys are the guys that come on Wednesday night. So I'm not saying something to you so you can look at all the other people and go, well, I was there. Where were you? That ain't going to help anybody either. But please, please be an ambassador for Jesus and encourage people that you know who know Jesus, encourage them to walk with Jesus. Encourage them that the Spirit of God will be there so that that very phrase that Jesus said, in that day, you're not going to ask me any question. To me, I look at that and I go, man, I've had that happen to me so many times where I'm in a situation and before I can even ask the question, the Holy Spirit's giving me the goods. It's not every single time, but I would say most of the time. There's many times where I'm confused, almost all the time, partially confused, but we're walking by faith. It's not, it's it's part of this relationship that we have with the Lord. But what a radical, radical thing to say. It's to your advantage that I go away. And this moment, that's happening between me and you guys, you're going to look back and remember this and you're going to have this experience with the Holy Spirit. And every single one of you is going to have it. That's how Christianity has conquered the Roman Empire and outlasted all these other empires and will outlast America. If the Lord tarries, Christianity will outlast communist China. It will outlast. That's why the Chinese government is so afraid of Christianity because they know it's more powerful. It's more powerful than the Communist Party. It's more powerful than Islam. It's more powerful than it. It's the most powerful thing because it's Jesus. And if we are connected to him, then everything that he wants to do, he'll be able to do. So Lord, help us. Help us, God, to be doers of the word. And Lord, I I pray in all my weakness and inability to communicate clearly, I I pray for my friends that as, as we've been reading these chapters together, that you will make these connections and these points clear Lord, thank you that you came and spoke like no one ever spoke. And thank you that you came and did things that nobody ever did. They never did before you and they've never done after you. Lord, you're, you're alone in history. This is the mo- most unique human being who ever lived. We thank you, Lord, for your power. We thank you for your presence and we pray you'd help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. God, help us to commune with you and walk in the Spirit so that we can get a victory over our flesh in every part of our life. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless the rest of your week, and I pray that uh, as you're in the Word, the Spirit will give you this direction, and He'll speak to you, and you won't stumble, and you'll have fullness of joy, and you, you'll have peace in the midst of tribulation, and you'll have direction, and And the questions that these guys were asking, we don't know the way, we don't know what you're doing, (laughs) show us the Father, that those questions all get answered by the Spirit as you seek Jesus. Amen? God bless you.